Good morning. Happy New Year. Well, it's the first Thursday of the new year, of 2023. And uh, this is Tom Padula from Tom Padula TV on YouTube and in Senior Booksellers. And, um, well, this morning is program 64 of uh, World History by me live on Facebook. And uh, uh, I think I'm going to have... Um, welcome to Asunda Lombardi. I think I'm going to have um, uh, this week... The next week, maybe I'll be away, So, uh, but I intend to finish a Lesson uh, 65 because um, I've got to a stage in the, the historical uh, timeline where uh, the world uh, gets to be known as a whole, all the continents. Uh, and this is important to, to realise that, uh, well, it's not quite all of it yet, but it's a good time to take a break from me and uh, then I'll come back and I'll continue. Uh, I'll continue with world history until uh, the modern times, basically. And then we might be able to look at um, various sections of uh, this wonderful journey of mine uh, relating to the history of mankind and womankind. Men and women. When you say men, you know, historically, it's always been uh, the men. Uh, they sort of have taken the uh, the prisons and they've included the women. But these days we are a bit more enlightened and uh, we want to include, uh, you know, the, the two s big sections of the world population, is men and women, and they deserve to be treated uh, on an equal basis, even though some people are more equal than others. That's how it is. Uh, you know, there's a lot of um, reflection to be done relating to uh, the, the two the two sexes. You know, in in uh, both in the human form and uh, in the animal uh, world as well. So, but what are we doing today? Today, I am actually going to look at the geographic and commercial revolutions that was caused by the travellers, by the, the pioneer travellers, if you like, the European discoveries of the world. Because, you know, they, they, they had, there was quite a bit of knowledge between uh, Europe and Asia, let's say, and the parts of Africa, Egypt, but, and the northern part uh, of uh, European and Asian continents, um, in terms of, uh, say, the Americas, they weren't known at the time, uh, but the people in Europe knew about uh, India and the spice trade. And because of the rise of the Turkish um, Ottoman Empire, uh, that imposed taxes on, on, on the travellers, the Christian travellers, uh, that were going to pick up um, the, the, the spices to bring back to Europe. So trade was somewhat... Uh, hindered, and as a result of that, then the Europeans thought, mm, well, you know what, we're going to discover another way to get there. And that's how how Christopher Columbus uh, thought of going around in order to get to India. That's why the American uh, natives are called Indians, because Christopher Columbus was looking for India, Indians from India. And now we refer to uh, the American Indians. Uh, it got nothing to do with India. They're Native Americans, Indigenous Americans. But, you know, uh, in the films we've watched from Hollywood, we always say cowboys and Indians. We didn't say cowboys and Native Americans. That's how it's been explained. Now, after that, I'll go to the dynasties of China, I'm getting the Shang dynasty I've touched on, the Zhu dynasty, I've, uh, I, you know, we saw that they're under the Zhu dynasty. There was, I'll read up about the Zhu dynasty as well again, and I will go to the Han dynasty uh, that um, brings us uh, to, the, to the times of the fall of the Roman Empire. At the height of the Roman Empire, this was the Tang dynasty. And so the the you know th that's where we're at, 
around the third, fourth, fifth centuries after the birth of Christ. After that, Africa, this, this week I'm going to touch on Tanzania and the, the Democratic Republic of Congo. There are three others. I'm not going to talk about them. They're going to be, uh, it's Congo. Uh, there's a section of Congo, not the Democratic Republic of Congo, but Congo, the Gabon and Equigenia. Okay. Uh, then uh, before the invasion, we'll keep going with, uh, you know, the history of our indigenous people and the various sections of um, of living uh, the, the way, you, you know, they approach songs and music uh, and the arts in general. Welcome to Angela Imola. Then there's Benja Patterson and Henry Lawson. And finally, my travels to the north. And today we're going to be in Broome. Uh, Broome, uh, we went to a mass there in the morning. And then uh, there was a flea market. Uh, and I'll show you those two sections. Okay, on that note, I think we are in 11.31. Cheers. Okay. Let me start. You know, you have to find the material. <laughs> All right. Um, European exploration of the world. So that's where we're at. The geographic and commercial revolutions, that's what they were. Nowhere was the spirit of, indiv of individualism of this age more evident than in the fields of exploration and business. Welcome to Bat Sancholo. As each man became his own master and authority in art and religion, so in the age of transition each explorer and merchant prince became an autocrat who accepted none but his own authority. So age of individualism, I'm the boss, that's it. Uh, Columbus and Magellan were rugged individualists who had ventured into the unknown on their own terms and imprinted their names in history as intrepid explorers. So too the, the Medici and the Fugas set forth on uncharted financial seas to build merchant empires and influence history. The Medici started the banking system in Europe. The synergetic individualism of the Christian culture came at a time when the other civilization of the world were in a passive state. As a result, the first great step towards unifying world civilizations was taken when European empires were created in primitive parts of the world. In the sense primitive, in the sense of Neolithic village life type of living. And also nomadic. Paleolithic. And contact was made again with other advanced cultures. And contact was made again uh, without mentioning China, of course. In this age, the dominance of Christian culture was definitely established. So again, these books here have got a, a Christian slant, a Christian historical slant. Uh, you know, the other religions don't get mentioned that much, except the Muslim ones, the Islam. Uh, but again, you know, the Christian one is looked after a lot better than all the others. And uh, in a way, in a way, rightly so, because of the Roman Empire, because of what happened to the Christians in the, the Middle Ages uh, and uh, all the advancements that were, that were made during those times. So this was the beginning of modern history which is the story of the merging of civilization into a single world of interrelated and interdependent cultures. And that's why I'm taking a break. I want to look at the, this, uh, this, uh, this part of interrelated, in other words, commerce uh, and uh, interdependence. You know, you've got this and I've got that, etc., etc. So what happens is that... Um, whether we like it or not, you know, the world is but one. And it began with these explorations here. As in the future, we will look into the universe and say, yeah, that's planet X, Y, Z. That belongs to Uganda. And the other one is, uh, you know, uh, where's Tom Padula's star? 
up there somewhere. I can't see it. <laughs> That's how it is. European exploration of the world. The motives of European exploration have been described as glory, gold, and God, the three Gs. <laughs> We're not talking about, uh, you know, the Wi-Fi system here. Glory, gold, and God was the Renaissance spirit of adventure, which turned many men to the high seas in search of fame and ambition. So what do we do ourselves there? We try to do it through the arts. Welcome to Tony Angelina. So gold was the desire to find better, more secure trade routes to the riches of India and China. So they knew about the Indian China because of Marco Polo. Uh, his book had been uh, uh, written up by many monks before the, the invention of the printing uh, printing machines uh, because they were already there in China, but they weren't in, in Europe. So Gutenberg started and he did a good job. The older routes lay through the Near East held at the time by the Ottoman Turks. And they involved many overland loadings and unloadings, expensive taxes and tolls, and attacks by pirates on land and sea. A lovely, lovely area to do business in. And this was when the Mongol Empire expanded and then retracted because of the Turks in that part of the world. European navigators felt that there must be better and safer routes uh, to the Far East, which they proposed to find by traveling around Africa or across the Atlantic. So God meant the desire to expand his kingdom by converting unknown pagans to the Christian faith. Now, that's why the Turkish, uh, the Turks uh, went ahead and uh, attacked the Mongols and the Byzantine Empire because of the Christian. They said, no, it's Islam. You know, we want Islam. Uh, they were fighting for Islam to the establishment of the, that particular religion by, because by that time the Christians uh, had become greedy and they weren't looking after the people they were in it for themselves in terms of money, bringing gold to Europe rather than looking after the people where they found them. So obviously the, the Turks fought, uh, fought this sort of situation and I've become better uh, informed by watching on Netflix the resurrection of Act Rule. Ertuchul Resurrection. If you watch it, it's about, I watch about 500, uh, there are five series of about 100 uh, episodes each. It's a long time. <laughs> but you've got to have the love for these things. Otherwise, you can't do it. Okay, so converting unknown pagans to the Christian faith. These motives combined to create an explosive movement in which Europeans explored the world and set up empires, drawing all civilization, civilizations into contact with the central dominant Christian culture of Europe. That's, so the exploration from Europe were made possible by technical inventions that enable adventurers to sail confidently on the Earth's high seas. The compass enabled ships to go beyond shorelines. They could look at the stars, north, south, east, west. And the astrolabe, astrolabe helped navigators determine their position by shooting the sun. I don't know what an astrolabe is, but it's a good one. I've got to look it up. So when you see something, do it. Improved maps and navigation charts showed them their position at sea, and thus the oceans became highways joining continents instead of barriers separating them. So the waters actually join the continents. They do not separate the continents. Good, a good reflection. So we have to be, we have to be very grateful. Uh, to brother uh, earth, mother earth and brother ocean. Now, who began all this? After Christopher Columbus, the Portuguese beginnings. Under Prince Henry the Navigator, 1394-1460. Now, 
Christopher Columbus went to uh, to what he thought India. That is, you know, he went, he ended up in America. In the well, in actually, not even the America. He ended up uh, in the islands close to America. So this under Prince Henry the Navigator, 1394, 1460. So that's 32 years before Christopher Columbus attempted his voyage. Port Portugal took the lead in exploring the Atlantic coastline in, uh, of Africa, and obviously Columbus knew about it. Henry the Egger, the, the best map makers, mathematicians, astronomers, and navigators to train Portuguese sailors in all the latest scientific aids to navigation. What a great guy. Never heard of him. For 40 years, he sent expeditions down the coast of Africa. Each of them brought back precious goods and additional knowledge of the African coastline. Henry's navigators discovered the Madeiras and Azores and in 1433 rounded the westmost, westernmost tip of Africa. The next year, the first cargo of African slaves arrived in Lisbon. There you are, gold in the form of slaves. Beginning a trade in human flesh that was to trouble Western civilization for centuries. Thank you to the Portuguese. But... The slaves had been there in Roman times. So how far back do we go? In 1487, that's five years before Christopher Columbus goes to uh, the Americas, Bartholomew Diaz rounded the tip of Africa, which he called Cape of Storms. That's a very dangerous area. A lot of storms there, lucky to get around it. But when the Portuguese King John II realised this discovery opened a sea, a sea route to India, he renamed it Cape of Good Hope. He says, go and get it. <laughs> he says, what do you mean? Uh, you know, Cape of, Cape of Storms becomes Cape of Good Hope. So don't get to the Good Hope, you could lose your life. Vasco da Gama rounded the Cape, secured an Arab pilot, and reached the Indian port of Calicut, Calcutta. Calicut was named. When he returned with spices and gems worth 60 times the cost of the expedition, that's good business, isn't it? 60 times. The Portuguese quickly sent merchants, soldiers and missionaries to follow up his explorations. <laughs> Vasco da Gama opened the opened the, the routes to, to India, to Calicut. They established themselves on the western coast of India at Goa and pushed to, eastwards to Malacca. And let's not forget the Portuguese, uh, the islands, you know, Indonesia, they, they were Portuguese colonies. But Portugal is next to Spain. So you think they, the Spaniards that are so much bigger and they sent Columbus to America are going to pull back? No way. So early Spanish exploration. The story of Columbus's accidental discovery of America is well known. The Italian navigator went from court to court to get financial backing to discover a westward route to the riches of India. Uh, he finally obtained Queen Isabella's support and sailed westward in 1492, the very year that Ferdinand threw out the Muslims from Spain, pushed them back in, into Africa. On four expeditions, he touched on several islands of the West Indies. That's why they're called Indies, India. They all come from this thing that he went to reach India and the coast of Central America claiming these lands for Spain. He put a flag and he said, this belongs to the... Uh, how can you do something like that? But he did, and it worked. In 1493, at Spain's request, Pope Alexander VI drew a line 100 leagues. A league is a measure of distance that has different from country to country and times to time. In Columbus, the Spanish league was 2.69 miles. 
that would be about, what, six, seven kilometers. So 100 leagues. Oh, well, whatever. And I've got a picture here of, um, but I'll show it to you afterwards when I've finished. I've still got a bit more to read. So in 1493, at Spain's request, Pope Alexander VI drew a line 100 leagues west of the Azores and Cape Verde Islands, giving Portugal the right to all lands discovered east of the line and Spain all west of it. Uh, the Pope, they went to the Pope. Which ones are you going to give us? He says, you can have 100 kilometers that way and the Spaniards can have the other ones. Well. Wow. The two countries agreed to move the line 270 leagues westward, thus giving Portugal a claim to Brazil, all of Africa and all Asia except the Philippines. Spain claimed all the Western hemispheres except Brazil. That includes all of South America. So that's why today Brazil speaks Portuguese and the rest of the places, they speak Spanish. Or, you know, the basic language is those. But then there are, of course, the changes with local languages and the inclusion of those in the language. So uh, Brazilian Portuguese would be very di a bit different from Portugal, Portugal Portuguese, and Spanish, uh, Spanish South America would be different from uh, the, the, Span the Spain from, uh, from, uh, from the Spanish from Spain. And in fact, I had personal experience here at Collingwood Education Centre when I was supervisor in uh, 1989, 90, I think 90, whatever. The, the, I had Spanish and Portuguese classes there. And uh, the Spanish teachers thought that, that the South, South American uh, Spanish teachers weren't supposed to be teaching Spanish because it wasn't Spanish what they knew. Uh, so these things last for centuries. Anyway, on, other countries, of course, did not accept the, this division of the world. The Pope decided, it says, you know, you give the red, most of the world to these two Catholic countries, so you're joking. So Spanish explorers pushed in all directions from their original base in the West Indies. Balboa discovered the Pacific Ocean in 1513. Balboa, that's not... Uh, Balboa from the film. <laughs> this is Balboa. Discovered the Pacific Ocean. In, it's, a, it's an explorer. 1513, Cortes, he was a nice man, this one, went to Mexico, Pizarro, and Pizarro to Peru, Coronado to present day, Texas, and beyond. So I've heard of Cortes and Pizarro. They were really, they, dis, they were unbelievable. Unbelievably rough. How could they call themselves Christians? Yet they imposed Christianity onto the locals. But not quite. Coronado, I did not, never heard of him, to present day Texas and beyond. Other Spanish explorers fanned out across South America in incredible marches, as well as up the California coast of North America and into Florida. Most spectacular of the early Spanish explorers was Ferdinand Magellan. In 1519, this brave mariner sailed westward from Spain to find a passage to India that had eluded Columbus. In August 1520, he discovered the icy straits of the tip of South America, which bear his name today. Ah, oh, that's interesting. So Magellan, Ferdinand Magellan. After an incredible difficult passage through these stormy straits, the expanse of water before him looked so pleasant that he called it the Pacific, <laughs> Pacific Ocean. So, you know, now why, <laughs> after so much trouble going through the oceans in the stormy, you know, Cape of Good Hope, Cape of Storms, and all the other rough places in the world, this guy here gets onto the Pacific Ocean, and he says, what's this? This is paradise on, earth, on water. <laughs> so he calls it Pacific Ocean. So you know what Pacific means. Now, Pacific Ocean comes from the fact that it's... But is it like that? 
uh, today, you know, we've got uh, El Nino, El La Nina coming from there. Uh, we've got a bit more knowledge these days. Okay. Magellan's little fleet was not prepared for the long passage across the Pacific. His sailors were reduced to eating leather, leather, and rats were, were a delicacy, <laughs> selling for half a ducat a piece. So if you caught a rat on the ship, good, good protein, huh? Magellan himself was killed in a skirmish with natives in the Philippines. He ended up badly. Only one of the original five ships and 18 of the 239 men completed the voyage. 18 of 239. Huh? 221 people died on this Magellan trip. But in 1522, the Victoria returned to Spain with a cargo that paid the entire cost of the expedition and with absolute proof that the world was round and could be circumnavigated. And I'm finishing there. That's what I've done today. Now, Portuguese, early Portuguese explorers and Spanish explorers next week. I'll do, the thing is, I can't finish it all because I'll continue with this uh, next. What I'll do, I'll just, uh, next week I'll conclude, you know, I'll put a bit of a conclusion here. And then uh, when I come back, when I come back, I'll do the rest. Now, I'll finish off the early English and French explorers. I'll do those. And then that's it. Then I'll... Uh, Wait for the commercial revolution, business, etc. That's where we'll start the next series. So lessons one to sixty-five, podcast one to sixty-five. I want to finish there because uh, you know uh, they also are all going on uh, on YouTube. I have to check all this work uh, in order for it to be available to everyone. It's free of charge, no charge from Tom Padula. Okay. Uh, all I ask people is that uh, if they want to send donations <laughs> for me to do even more work by employing other people, uh, we can do it. Donations, uh, buying books. Uh, I tell you, I can eat without any of your money. Of course, you can only do so much as an individual. The reality is that it's uh, in life. The minute you start, uh, you know, employing other people, etc., it's it's hard. Then you don't you lose your 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 self time. So, being a sole trader today, I, I see it as a um, as a blessing, in a way. With all that's happening in my life, uh, this is a blessing. We go to China now. I'm going to do the Zhu. The, we talked about the Shang Dynasty first, 1600 to 1600 before Christ to 1100. So the Zhu, 1100 to 256, that's a long time. That's 900 years. Okay, the Zhu originally retained their old capital in the Wei Valley, but they were driven from here by barbarians in 771 BC, before Christ. Barbarians. The barbarians, of course, were the Mongols and the people from the north. They then established themselves at Luoyang until they were eliminated by the Qin in 256 BC. And I've just finished seeing the Qin Empire on, on Netflix. I recommend it. It's good historical fodder. Uh, it's quite interesting too and entertaining. There are how many... There, there are quite a few series. It's you know, it's it's a, not as long as after resurrection, but it's quite long as well. Okay, so the, then they established themselves at Luoyang until they were eliminated by the Qin, 
QIN in 256 BC. The areas covered by the Zhu vassal states extended from approximately Beijing in the north to a little below the Yangtze in the south, the Yangtze River. And this is called the Eastern Zhu Dynasty, 771 to 256. So 221 to 206, between 230 and 221, we see the Qin engulfed their six rivals. And that's what the Qin Empire is all about on Netflix. Slowly but surely, the Qin adopted a different strategy because the states were fighting each other, a bit like feudal, the feudal people in Italy and France and Germany. So they were the, the other state, six states were Han, Zhao, Wei, Chu, Yan, and Qi. To establish their first empire, they too had their capital in the Wei Valley. Several states had built walls to protect their frontiers. The Qin linked three of these to form the beginning of the Great Wall. Okay, so in 206 BC, it comes to an end. The Qin, after so much, they formed this particular, uh, this particular state, the first em empire, the first big state of China. Uh, they combined six small states into one. So Western or former Han, 206 BC, 28. For 200 years then, the Han, the Western or former Han, before the Han dynasty proper. The Han had first made their capital in the Wei Valley at Xi'an, close to the cities of the Zhu and Qin capitals, Luoyang and... Anyway, doesn't matter. Luoyang and... which was the other one? Oh, well. After the throne had been usurped by Wang Mang and his Xin new dynasty, the imperial family re-established themselves at Luoyang. At its peak, the Han Empire stretched as far west as the Pamir Mountains and included North Korea in the north and North Vietnam in the south. The Great Wall now reached all the way to Jade Gate at Dunhuang and the Silk Road was opened up. And the later Han Dynasty was 23 BC, 23 AD, to 2020 uh, AD, that's after Christ, Xin, or after the, you know, the Roman calendar, because they've got their own calendar as well. Xin AD, Xin AD. So this one, the, those three generals usurped uh, the, the first Han was created by the, these three generals that split up the Zhu, the Zhu lands. Okay. Three kingdoms, 220 to 265. So we're looking at 45 years here. There were the, these were the sections in which three of the Han generals carved up the empire amongst them. Now, six dynasties, 265 to 589 AD. That's huh? after Christ. The so-called period of this, this union is subdivided into a great many dynasties and kingdoms. The most important were the Wei dynasty in the north and in the south the six dynasties of Western Jin, Eastern Jin, Liu Song, Southern Qi, Liang and Chen. Now I know where some of the surnames come from of my students, you know. Uh, who were doing Italian, but of Chinese background. S uh, Sui, 589 to 618. So this is half a century, uh, half a millennia after the birth of Christ. The Sui re reunited China with the capital once more at Xi'an. They built the first Grand Canal, linking the existing waterways from the Yangtze to the Yellow River, and then on up, the way to Xi'an. Wow, what a job. I've read about it as well. Very interesting. Now, the Tang Dynasty. Now, I'm going to stop there because the Tang Dynasty now aligned with, uh, with what I, I was doing for China before because I'm not going to read 
from, you know, Chinese history, or just in these particular uh, dynasties. So, Shang, Zhu, Han, the first big three. And then there are variations within them. Again, Shang, S-H-I-N-G, Zhu, Z-H-O-U, and Han, H-A-N. And then after this, we're going to be looking at the Tang and Song and Wan. So we'll have to wait there for that. Okay, so that's done as well. Now we're going to go to Africa. Now before I go to Africa, I'm going to show you where they are, these places. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot to show you the other bit. Uh, never mind. Next next week. Next week I'll show you the, the travellers, the explorers. Here we go. I'm very happy now to be using my technology really properly. Here we go. See that? Last week we, we've done so far. We've done South Africa, you got Lesotho, Swaziland, Botswana, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Malawi, Zambia and Angola. We've done those. Now we've got to Tanzania, Democratic Republic of Congo. The little yellow bit there is Congo. Then there is Gabon and Equi Guinea. The little square there. Okay. So... I won't mention Congo, Gabon, Equi Guinea. Maybe uh, I'm not sure whether I should do that. Uh, I won't do that today. I'm just going to do Tanzania and Democratic Republic of Congo, and I'm going to start with the Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Okay, back to me. That's it. <laughs> well. That's good. Okay, let's have a look at the Democratic Republic of Congo. The People's Republic of Congo. It's here in this book. In the, in the, so there are variations. And also, uh, it could also be that uh, these particular uh, summaries of mine uh, now, you know, coming from older books, etc., they need to be updated. You can do that. Congo, the People's Republic of, a republic in the West Central Africa, sometimes referred to as Congo Brazzaville, which covers 130 square miles or 336,700 square kilometers, formerly French or Middle Congo. The territory lies across the equator, much of it consisting of dense tropical forests containing valuable timber. Commercial exploitation is hampered by transport difficulties. Meno male. <laughs> Lucky, otherwise you lose, you lose a lot of uh, very valuable, uh, I don't know, uh, oxygen for, for, our, uh, for our atmosphere. But, you know, they were looking at the short term. They're looking at there's plenty of good wood there. We're going to pick it up and take it to Europe. They make, you know, a lot of money. The territory lies across the equator, much of it consisting of dense tropical forests containing valuable timber. Commercial exploitation is hampered by transport difficulties. The country's main exports consist of industrial diamonds, wood products, gold and oil. Welcome to Angela Padula. Uh, in 1970, Congo declared itself a communist state and is generally regarded as one of the more radical countries on the African continent, although generally it maintains a low international profile. They just want to do their own thing. That's what uh, population, uh, I won't tell you. You've got to look it up. I don't know how many people they've got now. But anyway, we go from there to Tanzania. United Republic of Tanzania. East African Republic composed of Tanganyika, 
Tanganyaka and Zanzibar, which became united in April 1964. For the next 20 years, under the presidency of Julius Nairere, the country played a remarkable role in African affairs. The Arusha Declaration of 1967 was a classic statement of the problems uh, of development. Experiments in socialism and Ujamaa, collective life, village life, were unique in Africa, while Tanzania played a, dealing, a leading part as frontline states in the confrontation of black Africa with the white minority regimes in the southern part of the continent. Welcome to Libby Petrella. So that's Tanzania for you. That's, um, uh, you know, the, these uh, African states, they need to be looked at by all of us. Uh, because, you know, we ignore Africa a lot in our daily living, but they've got a beautiful history as well. Okay, so now we're going to go to uh, before the invasion. Now, before the invasion last week, we've covered quite a lot for those people who are new. I've covered so far. Uh, a long time ago, the land and the people, water and food, weapons and tools, canoes and containers, life, life's sacred meanings, families and groups and childhood, women and men, death and mourning, health and medicine, keeping the laws, languages of Australia, ceremonies, songs and stories. That's where we are now. Very soon I'll be finished with this as well. And... Uh, I wanted to, well, you know, you can't, I, I have to align things. And then when I finish with um, uh, this, you know, lesson 65, I'll take a break, as I said, and uh, next week, actually, I will be away. So it'll be the week after that I'll complete it. I was going to go to Sydney, but the, the, the trip has been cancelled for Sydney. So now uh, I'm here, I'll be able to come back after next week. Next Thursday, I won't be on, and uh, I'll continue the week after, and that'll be the last one for the series, and I'll make sure then you can access this on my YouTube channel. I've checked it uh, under Tom Padula TV. YouTube, you have to go to, uh, on YouTube, you have to go to where my face is in a round circle. You press that, and it gives you all my work on online on YouTube, which also contains all the work from um, from previous years, from 20 years ago onwards. Because I've been at this now with, um, you know, making theatre videos, etc., uh, since 1990. So it's quite a, a long time. And before that, I was always, you know, in teaching and uh, it's always been with people. Okay, let's go. Now, this time here, we stopped at coming to it as a meteorite. was the last one, last time. Songs and stories. Changes in the land, the drying up of lakes and even the flooding of coastal, of coastal lands occur in some legends. So, the floods are getting now. They're talking about it, drying up of lakes, etc., and the flooding, of course. So, occur in some legends, some of the legends of uh, the original inhabitants of this of this continent were there. If we know when these geolo geological events happened, we can guess the age of the legends. The earliest are said to date back ten thousand years. They are some of the oldest recorded stories in the world. Wow. We're not familiar with these. They didn't say in the year 2000 that this is the legend. How do you know? You know, I mean, this is a pro-Indigenous book, uh, and quite rightly so. Uh, in the 1980s, 70s, 80s, you know, because let's face it, the, the Indigenous population wasn't counted until 1967 in Australia. So it's been a, a pretty rough journey for for them during the period of the invasion, but the invasion continues. And as I've said 
this week on my program on Channel 31 on Tuesdays, which will be repeated on Friday, this Friday. I think it's 12, 12 30, 1 o'clock. You can check it. And uh, I was listening to it. It was incredible, uh, making a lot of sense in what I was saying. But I listened to it myself. So, you know, when, when you do this sort of work and you keep going, uh, then you have to review what you've done and uh, you have to have a critical eye as well to say, oh, well, I made a mistake there, I didn't. So you have to be confident about your mistakes. You never learn anything from what you know. You learn everything from what you don't know or from what the mistakes you make. Uh, okay. Aborigines had many kinds of story. One type was similar to our ghost or ogre horror stories. Instead of a cemetery or a haunted house, the ghosts or ogre, O-G-R-E, man-eating monster, lived in a dense patches of bush, deep gullies in the hills, or hid around caves and waterholes, waiting to catch on unwary people. Bunyip is the best known of these. Aborigines of Victoria said Barnip lived in swamps and waterholes. I think I've mentioned him in one of my poems. These monsters and ghosts were blamed for any unexplained disappearance of a man, a woman or child, and for all misfortune in general. You could be eaten by a dingo. He says, oh, this was terrible. You know, it must have been Barnip who did it. Other legends or tales described how an ancestor and his family in the dreaming first arrived in a particular area and opened it up for people. In these myths, the ancestor or hero was said to have made certain changes in the landscape. And after many adventures, he died and rose into the sky where he became a group of stars, whereas we send ours to paradise. <laughs> Many of these men hero tales belonged to southern Australia. In the north, the central character of the legends was often given the name, the name of an animal or plant, and at the end of the tale, he became that animal or plant. That's how that plant, the boa, boa uh, the boab tree, for example, that must have legends about it because it's, it's a fat tree. Every clan or group in Australia had many stories explaining the special things about certain animals or birds, how the kangaroo got his tail, why the kangaroo hops, how goanna and lizard got their painted backs, and so on. But we've got, you know, stories told by our grandparents and parents. Uh, we can make things up and then they become part of the folklore of your family. That's what happened in Aboriginal communities. And they were never in large numbers, grouped together in large numbers. It's Neolithic nomadic people, but with defined, defined uses of the territory. This territory belongs to this group of people, this other one. So, and they became the name of those areas. So the popular stories of the Aboriginal people were often educational in content. They were told to show an acceptable pattern of behaviour. Some told how selfish people came to a bad end. <laughs> they still do. <laughs> Not all of them, though. Uh, some of them get away with it. The more sacred myths about the travels of the ancestral beings were also educational. From them, young people learned the detailed geography of their territory. They learned the landmarks of the country and the routes to follow to reach water. In fact, there were word maps. A member of the tribe could know where he was by remembering the story. Even the stars were related to the people. The people knew when they saw certain stars in the sky that it was time, it was time to gather certain foods. Amazing. The people living in the Victorian Mallee considered that the larvae of the wood ant was good eating. They ate the larvae of the wood ant. By watching the movements of the star Arcturus, they knew when the larvae were in abundance and ready to be gathered. 
Arcturus, I-R-C-T-U, R-U-S. So they looked at that star and said, now it's time to eat the larvae. When the star finally set with the sun, they knew the season was over. Arcturus was called Marpinkurk, Marpinkurk, after an, ance an, an, an ancestress who was said to have discovered the lava. The tale said that when it, she died, she ascended into the sky to become the star. Good one. She cared for her people and became Arcturus in order to let them know when the grubs were ready to be gathered. She, she became the star in order to help the people down and say, when I'm there near the sun, you know, you go for the lava. When I'm not there behind the sun, don't go there. Beautiful story. Now, are they, have they been recorded? I don't know. I mean, you know, I taught this from this book in the 1980s. And now, 12 or 15, it's good. I've got two little stories now. One, they're both short, so we should be able to manage today, and then I'll go to, uh, to my travel, okay? On the track, our friend, Banjo Patterson. I love Banjo. So far, I've done quite a few of his work. You know, there, there was, some of them are really beautiful stories. And this book here was given to me by my son, Jason, in 2008. And then finally, I'm reading it. On the track. Oh, the weary, weary journey on the track, day after day, with sun above and silent veldt below. And our hearts keep turning homeward to the youngsters far away and the homestead where the climbing rows grow. Shall we see the flats grown golden with the ripening of the grain? Shall we hear the parrots calling on the bough? Ah, the weary months of marching year, we hear them call again, for we are going on a long job now. In the drowsy days on escort, riding slowly half asleep, with the endless line of wagons stretching back, while the khaki soldiers travel like a mob of travelling sheep, plodding silently on the never-ending track, while the constant snap and sniping of the foe you never see makes you wonder, will your turn come, when and how? As the Moza ball hums past, you like a vicious kind of bee. Oh, we're going on a long job now. When the dash and the excitement and the novelty are dead and you are seen a load of wounded, wounded once or twice, Oh, you've watched your old mate dying with the vultures overhead. Well, you wonder if their war is worth the price. And down along the Monaro, now they are starting out to shear. I can picture the excitement and the row. But they'll miss me on the Lachlan when they call the roll this year, for we're going on a long job now. Going to war. I presume this is the bar war. Okay. Let's... Uh, with old Benjamin Patterson, in the midst of the Boer War, he reflected, why go there when you got shearing ships to shear? That's it. Now, this other one here is a good one. Uh, his name is Henry Lawson. Hmm? Henry Lawson. And this one, this particular uh, story is Rats. It's called Rats. I'll read you half of it and then the next half next week. Okay, so I said I'll I'll go to where I said I go to to, to yeah, okay. Why there is two of them and they are having a fight? Come on, it seemed a strange place for a fight. That hot, lonely cotton bush plain, and yet no more than half a mile ahead, there were there were apparently two men struggling together on the track. The three travellers postponed their smoke o and hurried on. They were shearers, like a little man and a big man, known respectively as Sunlight and Macquarie, and a tall, thin, young jackaroo whom they called Milky. I wonder where the other men sprang from. I didn't see him, I didn't see him before, said Sunlight. 
I must have been lying down in the bushes, said Macquarie. They're going at it proper, at it proper too. Come on, hurry up and see the fun. They hurried on. It's a funny looking fella, the other fella, panted Milky. He don't seem to have no head. Look, he's down. They're both down. They must have clinched on the ground. No, they're up at it again. Why? Good Lord. I think the others are women. My oath, so it is, yelled Sunlight. Look, the brute's got her down again. He's kicking her. Come on, chaps, come on, or he'll do it for her, or he'll do for her. They dropped swags, water bags and all, and raced towards, but presently Sunlight, who had the best eyes, slackened his pace and dropped behind. His mates glanced back at his face, saw a peculiar expression there, looked ahead again, and then dropped into a walk. They reached the scene of the trouble, and there stood a little withered old man by the track, with his arms folded close up under his chin. He was dressed mostly in calico patches and half a dozen corks suspended on, on bits of string from the brim of his hat, dangled before his bleed optics to scare away the flies. He was scowling malignantly at a stout, dumpy swag which lay in the middle of the track. Well, old rats, what's the trouble? asked Sunlight. Oh, nothing, nothing, answered the old man. Without looking round, I fell out with my swag. That's all. He knocked me down, but I've settled him. Swag. Hmm. Well, I'm going to stop there. That's what I said I would do. I did it. <laughs> we'll continue from there next week. That's the, the story is called Rats. And the cover of my book is falling apart. Never mind. We'll fix it up. Okay, my travels now. We are in Broome. And enjoy it because you're going to be, uh, you know, it's a Sunday morning. We, we, you know, on the tour, uh, you have to go to church, etc. Part of the tour. All good experience. There we are. There we are. Our Lady Queen of Peace Cathedral, Catholic Cases of Broome. Okay, what's next? That's the church. More pictures. And of course, one, a tourist. I'm a tourist here. And this is uh, looking out from the church. Beautiful area. Again. And it's somebody going in the church. Ah, yes, that's it there. Nice. And there's a lady there. Very well organised. That's the priest there. There he is. That's outside. It's outside. And this now, <laughs> I forgot to edit this particular picture. Okay, again, my sister and me. Oop. Look at the beautiful tree. Now, this is the market, the flea market, okay? On a Sunday morning. Quite a lot to see. Here's some of the... Whoop. Yeah. Beautiful brooches. Yeah, yeah. They get inspiration from the sea, obviously. Reef Chief Australia.
different types of trees everywhere. And uh, the Moab, yeah. Nice setup too. It was it wasn't too hot, it was all right. Nice one, sir. Nice. I like when people smile. I didn't mind me filming. Look how beautiful is that? Colorful. Hats. Hmm, should have bought one of those. <laughs> Uh, attraction, jewelry. How are we going? Hope you're enjoying this. It's as if you're there, except it's a different experience. Photography. So much creativity, ah, just amazing. Human effort. Broom time. Broom company. When I film, I film, eh? Dogs in sync. There we are. That's it. Maybe we should have some music with this as well. Oh, just got an idea. Maybe I'll show you this with some music next time. Yes. Australian music would be good. Bush music, country music. Good idea, Tom, huh? Uh, I think we, we're finished with this. Back. Are uh, we going towards the city now? The centre of Broome. That's where we were close to this area. Close to this area. Oh. How we go? Yeah, look, what I'll do, I'll stop here. It's a good, a good picture to stop. And I'll go back to me and uh, I'll conclude for today. Just... Thank you very much for watching.
Oh, but I've got a good idea today that uh, whilst I'm doing this, I felt, you know, I felt something come into me and say, you should put some music to this as well. Maybe I will do that next time to finish off. Next time. Don't forget, next week, I'm not here. But I've got a few announcements now to make. This week, I finished off with Italian Lessons 1 to 60. And as a result of that, last week I finished. I put them on YouTube. 1 to 60, they're all there, except a couple of them I have to review this Monday coming. I'll, so I'm trying to get the whole of the 60 lessons per perfectly put, put up on YouTube and you can access them through YouTube, one, by going to Tom Padula TV or Tom Padula TV on YouTube and then you select. What you do then, what you do then, you can also go to insegna.com because then in the blog section, you've got the lessons one after the other. <clears throat> Again, is this anything missing? I have to uh, revise because, you know, the, there's technical uh, things involved here and we don't always get it totally right. But once you finish something, then you can go back and check it out. And that's what I will be doing. Okay. Also, Dante Alighieri, this Sunday, I return with Canto 22 or 23. I think Canto 22 of Purgatorio. And I will continue then for each Sunday. Okay. After that, uh, I'll keep going. And on the Friday, I've got French and Spanish. Because I'm on lesson 41, 42, I think I will keep going with the French and the Spanish uh, till about 60 again, and then I'll take a break from there. So from now on, uh, welcome to Giuseppe Navagliano. From now on, I will be uh, completing these particular projects of mine, and I'll start new ones. Um, I will announce them as I go along, uh, keeping th these times going, but with, with different with different things. I would like to know from people, what would you like me to cover? If the ABC can do it, they can ask you. Yeah, I've been asking, what would you like to see? Uh, well, Tom Badura was asking his, his people, what would you like me to do in terms of Italian uh, culture, Italian language or history? Which, what parts, what are you interested in? What can I do for you? Are there other themes or topics that you would like me to cover? I can tell you this now. I've already chosen two of them. One will be for children, young children, zero to about 12 or whatever, you know, children. And the other one, believe it or not, I am... <laughs> <laughs> I've become a pretty good cook in, for certain things. So because I want to start, let's say, using the oven, all these things here, I'm going to actually enjoy myself um, looking at what's available in my Insegna warehouse in terms of cookbooks. Now, I can tell you... <laughs> <laughs> I've got, I'm not, I'm not joking. I honestly am not joking. I've got about 50, 60, I don't know, 70 uh, boxes of cookbooks there. And I've put quite a few online. I've got about 200 of them online, which you can select from. And there is so much, such a wealth of um, experience in those books from various people. And, of course, they all have, you know, it's like uh, the adventurers, you remember? The adventure, the travellers. Well, these people are travellers in art, travellers in cooking. What do they want? What does anyone want? Glory. Uh, glory, glory, hallelujah. And then once you've got the glory, it says, what about some gold? <laughs> I want to make some money out of it. And then the next one will be, 
Yeah, but now I've got the glory, I've got the gold. Now I want other people to follow what I cook and eat what I cook. So that's like being on a mission. Religion. <laughs> so don't forget glory, God, and uh, glory, gold, and God. Those are the three Gs that apply to programs as well and to people in general. Okay, on this note, thank you very much for watching today. I've enjoyed it. I've gone five minutes over. Doesn't matter. It's uh, holiday time. And uh, I wish you the very best for the weekend. Uh, and I'll see you in a couple of weeks' time. This will be less than 65 next, next time I see you. And that will be it for the series. So it's been a quite a long journey for me. And I'm glad that I'll be glad when it's over. It's not over until it's over. Okay, ciao, this is Tom Padula from Tom Padula TV on YouTube and of course Insegna Booksellers. Arrivederci.